Hello there and welcome. I am Michelle Pekansky-Brock. I'm faculty mentor for did, um, online teaching and learning with CVC and At One in the California Community Colleges. Very happy to have you here today. Um, we are joined by, by barking dogs in the background. And today we are here for amplifying student stories as an equity minded practice. This is such a special event and I know that you're gonna love it. We have two online teaching superstars with us today. Martez Apigo, who's the DE coordinator, OER coordinator, and English professor at Contra Costa College. I have to read the screen because these two do so much that I can't remember it all. Um, and Denise Fidjuli Williams, who's an, the online accessible accessibility mentor and also an English and ELAC professor at San Diego Miramar College. More importantly, they are two incredibly dedicated instructors who always put their students first and who are always standing up for the value and the importance of online education for serving the needs of students who can't get to, call, to campus all the time. And they are two people who I have learned so much from, and I continue to learn so much from, and I'm so grateful that they have extended their time um, to us to, to share with us here today. So I'm gonna stop talking and turn things over to Martez and Denise now. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, I appreciate that warm introduction, Michelle. Welcome everyone, hello, and thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, my name is Martez Apigo. And I'm Denise Maduli Williams. And Denise and I are both at one course facilitators as well. Okay, so to get us warmed up, we wanna invite you to share in the chat. Why are stories important to our lives? And we'll give you a couple of moments to, to uh, think about that and put your responses in the chat. I'm seeing so many goodies in the Chatterfall. I can barely <laughs> keep up, um, but I'm seeing things like legacy and um, giving us a voice and stories often hold emotions. Yes, so if you're like me, then you love hearing a good story. Mm -hmm. Storytelling helps humans understand ourselves and others. We feel empathy with characters it creates cognitive and emotional connections with others. It builds trust. It makes information memorable. Storytelling shapes our perspective of the world. So as we get started, we wanted to start here. We come to our teaching practice and this presentation and the work we're sharing today through the lens of these amazing educators and leaders, and we just want to acknowledge them um, and start with them. Okay, so go ahead and type yes in the chat if you've watched Chimamanda Ngozi's Adichie's TED Talk on the danger of the single story. Here comes the chatterfall. Yes, lots all yeses. yeses. It's all yeses. Yes, <laughs> yes. And so, shared with students. Yes. Yeah, so many of you already have. In fact, she's received over 30 million views of her TED Talk, where she warns us of the danger of centering a single dominant Eurocentric narrative. She highlights that stories matter. Many stories matter. Stories have been used to dispossess and to malign, but stories can also be used to empower and to humanize. 
stories can break the dignity of a people, but stories can also repair that broken dignity. Did I skip one, Martez? Yeah. <laughs> That was my next slide. It is? OK. All right. <laughs> well, um, in a, a past online teaching conference keynote, Dr. Luke Wood shared with us five Bs, including be relational, be community centric. Relationship building happens and trust develops when we listen to our students' stories. We foster a classroom community by allowing students to share their stories with one another. There's the other slide, Marjorie. There it is. Okay. <laughs> We're like, what happened? <laughs> so um, in Zaretta Hammond's Ready for Rigor framework in her book, Culturally Responsive Teaching in the Brain, she has a section there on information processing where she explains help students process new content using methods from oral traditions, connect new content to culturally relevant examples and metaphors from students' community and everyday lives. As instructors, we can seek ways to draw from our students' communities, their lives and stories, and connect those to our course content. Students come to us with so many assets, life experiences, narratives, cultures, backgrounds. So let's capitalize off of it and amplify their voices. So in her book, Cultivating Genius, Dr. Muhammad discusses the first layer of her framework and it begins with identity development. And this is what she says. It is our job as educators to not just teach skills, but also to teach students to validate and celebrate who they are. So we always start with stories in our classes. And I think you'll see in the activities and projects we share today that we're grounded in sharing um, stories that celebrate our students' identity and their excellence. Okay, so this is a big slide here, but it kind of shows how we feel when we're listening to a story. Whenever I hear a story um, that someone's privileged to share with me, or I'm able to share something personal with someone else, it's the magical feeling that I have inside. It touches us and we learn from it. And this graph shows how storytelling um, affects the brain. And I'll just briefly go over these four points. But the first one is about neural coupling. Um, and this is so interesting. The story activates parts in the brain that allows the listener to turn the story into their own ideas and experience. When, when we hear a story, the listeners are mirroring not just the same brain activity with each other as listeners, but to the storyteller. The speaker and the listener are coming together. That amazing magical feeling that we have is dopamine that's just being released into our system when we hear or tell a story. And our brain is activated in so many areas, including the motor cortex, sensory cortex, and frontal cortex. I'm gonna bring up Zaretta Hammond again because she says something very special about this. She says, the brains of the storyteller and the listener fire in unison, and we begin to feel empathy and compassion towards one another. It's really beautiful. How do we make this magic happen in the classroom? Is through videos. We share our own instructor stories through video, and we also create spaces for our students to share their stories with each other. So I'm gonna start by sharing some of the video projects that are incorporated in my classes. And I wanted to give you a little bit of background. So um, in the San Diego Community College District, we have ELAC, which is English Language Acquisition. For, so that's um, English for um, speakers of multiple languages. I also teach um, English composition. 
And these are projects and work from classes that have been fully online even before the pandemic. Michelle mentioned that Martez and I have been longtime um, enthusiasts for online learning. So these are classes that have been fully online asynchronous. So we know how important um, building that community is and how thoughtful and intentional it must be in an online space especially in my classes that are made up of students from all different very varying um, backgrounds language cultures history starting with their story and their identity is the only way for us to come together and build community and those relationships are more important than any other pedagogical concern or content or skills so I want to start with an example of one way that I begin an introductory activity for students. And this example is from this semester's um, English language acquisition intermediate level listening and speaking class. So we all know that um, students do many, many different icebreakers, and many of them are just kind of tell a little bit about yourself, introduce yourself, perhaps there's a video component or a written component. But this one is visual. It asks students what they would hold in their hands. What is something that you can hold in your hand that you will carry with you forever? Perhaps it was given to you or you received it or you found it, but you will always keep it no matter how many times you move and you will pass it down for generations. So something priceless, but not necessarily expensive. So there's many different ways um, that this can be approached. And you can see here, I know many of us use Canvas. So this is kind of what this looks like as a Canvas introduction activity where they get information about the topic. Um, they make some notes, they practice, and then they record it. I always start with my example. This is actually um, a, a teacup that I was given from my grandmother who just passed away last year um, at 103 years old. And that is something that I will keep and hold forever. So I always start with myself. But you can kind of see the different things that students have. On the left, we have some baby teeth. Um, the student really felt passionate about his guitar, and even though this relieves the pressure by not having to show your face or anything, he wanted to show his face and he's in there strumming along a little bit. We have this amazing card and book, we have a ring, um, and we have a box of like just things, right? So the really cool thing about this activity is students share first with the image and you don't really know what it is. So one way I have done this is telling the story through text. Um, and just sharing on a Padlet. And then students can comment and share with each other. But there's something, as we know, really, really magical when you tell a story with the human voice. And so I often have students use Flipgrid to do this. And again, remember that this is um, English language learners. So this creates the time and the space and the choice for them to share in the way that's best for them. And we learn so much about each other. I'm going to play just a little bit of one. And Flipgrid does have auto captions. They're not perfect. So these aren't things that students have typed in the captions. It's Flipgrid doing their very best to, to um, capture the captions here. So I'll play a little bit. Martez, give me a thumbs up to make sure we can hear this. Hi, teacher. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, explaining about presentation one about what will you hold. Object or better to say what is very important to me in, is my mother's rosary. Ever since my mother died eight years ago, I always uh, carry this rosary with me. I can smell my mother from uh, this rosary. I follow her by my side everywhere. This black rosary is with uh, beads uh, perhaps worthless, but for me it is full of meaning and uh, concept of my mother's love. Whenever I feel sad and depressed, I gain uh, strength uh, by touching uh, this rosary. This rosary by holding this uh, rosary in my hand. I feel uh, revived and uh, start again. It is the only memory I love I have uh, of my mother here in US. So I'm going to pause it there. 
Um, so you can see just by telling the story how much we learn about the student, but you can also just imagine the connections that are formed as students hear her story, because we all have mothers and we all know that feeling um, of having an item that smells like this person that's important to you, right? So what we do then is have students comment on each other's. And again, um, for language learners, this is wonderful because you know they can record and repeat as many times as they want until they feel comfortable and they're starting with excellence in their language they're starting with being able to share their identity in a safe and powerful way i'm going to play just a little bit of a comment so again the students in this case are not required to show their face so we have a beautiful flower here and this is a student replying to the story she just heard um, from sylvia hello maria I am Sylvia. I really like your story about your um, mother's rosary. Um, it's really interesting and um, precious, the story that you are telling us about, um, the, about uh, that you can uh, remember your mom when you are smelling the rosary because the rosary is keeping her smell. And um, also I can say that you are lucky, you no, know, because you have something that makes you get in relief. If you are feeling sad. It's, um, I think um, what you have is really valuable. Thank you. I just love how the students always thank each other for sharing their stories. And when I heard this the first time, I just heard Maria's voice shift when she said you're so lucky you know to have that and to carry that and to have that smell so one of the most wonderful things about this project is that students forge connections like oh i have you know this piece of jewelry as well or i have a card that someone gave me when i left my country that i keep under my pillow or on my bed or i have this other item as well and they're really sharing and learning from each other you can um hear the compassion and empathy that they have for each other i did see a question in the chat about the instructions and the instructions are quite specific about selecting um, the object and really thinking um, about what it is and how to explain it um, and what you want to say about it so that they are actually taking notes and preparing before they record it so it's not a really on the fly presentation and that's why the examples get very very deep very quickly Okay, I want to share this next activity that I do. So, you know, still in early of the semester, I then have students work on a digital photo story. Um, and we know that it's really, really fun for students to share their students and their identities. Um, but it can be overwhelming, right? Like, what's your story? How do we get to this part where you can kind of do it in a short, um, succinct, clear way? So what I do is I have students follow the Pixar story spine. And I do want to say at the end of the slides, there's a resource link and there's a link to a presentation I gave about this specific digital photo story with the lesson laid out. But if you haven't heard of the Pixar story spine, it's basically the one that is used to create any Pixar movie. And it goes like this. Once upon a time, every day, until one day, because of that, because of that, because of that, until finally and ever since then so i love this and you can actually go to khan academy and like see pixar uh, movie makers and writers talk their way through different pixar movies um, but what is we're, what we're looking for here is how did they get to miramar college so their kind of climatic point there until finally is until finally i came here to miramar college so everyone follows that story spine and we find out what brought you here Right. So what I really like about this, once again, is the flexibility and the choice of students to share however much they feel comfortable with. Right. Uh, because we want to provide a space where they can build up to how much they want to share and how much they feel comfortable sharing about their identity. So some students and I'll show you an example are super excited and they pack it full of personal video or personal photos and and tell like they're, you know, really important moments from their life. Others are able to use, um, you know, other um, images or take another twist to it where they might not be willing to be completely open yet, but we learn a little bit about them. But we all find out like why are we here at Miramar College and I and I start with my story too about how we got here 
So the other great thing is that it gives students the time and space to create this. So if someone asks, you know, in like a think pair share or something right away, or maybe a quick discussion board, like, how'd you get here? Um, it's a quick answer, right? So this really causes students to think through their story spine. What are the events that led them here? So I'm gonna share one example. Um, I have many over the years, but this is one of my favorites. Um, and I wanna say that Marta has helped me out. This is used with Adobe Spark video, which is now changed to Adobe, Adobe Creative Cloud, Cloud Express. <laughs> Yes, Adobe Creative Cloud Express. So that is the new name. So you'll see Spark here. This video is on the Spark page. And when students upload them now, I have them bring it into either YouTube or Canvas Studio to caption it. This one is not captioned. So if you um, would like to, don't forget, you can click below to the, the live captions um, to caption this while it's playing. So I'll play this in full. Listen for the story spine. And here is Tan's story. My name is Thang, and this is my story. Every day, I felt happy to be born and grow up in Hanoi, a beautiful city of Vietnam. I even planned to stay there for the rest of my life, like my parents. Until one day, I fell in love with a guy at college, and we got married. Because of that, when he got a job offer by UCSD, I decided to follow my heart and move with him to the States, where our little angel was born. Because of that, I had to stay at home to take care of the baby full time. Because of that, what I did all day was just housework and baby stuff. So I lost all the English and the working skills which I once had. Until finally, I started taking classes at Miramar College. And ever since then, I have been trying my best to improve my English, broaden my knowledge, so that one day I will become a scientist to fight disease and save lives. I think you can see that why that's one of my favorites. So students share these either, you know, you could do a, a, a discussion board where you embed them, you can share them on a Padlet. But the idea is that we, when we look around the classroom or we look around the black boxes or on Zoom or we log into Canvas, we don't know our students' stories. And more importantly, they don't know each other's stories. So by doing this early on, the students are able to build connections with each other that helps us thrive as a class. Composition and writing, learning language is scary stuff. How are you going to share a piece of writing with a group and ask them to peer review it when you don't know anything about them and you're really concerned um, that they're going to judge you, right? How do you try to speak in a language that's not your first language and wonder if people will understand you? So starting with their stories and all that they bring and all of the assets and identities that they have means that our community is going to be strong and then we can move move into skill building and content. OK, so the very last thing I want to show is just to, um, some instructor videos. So we can't really ask students to do this if we don't do it ourselves, right? Um, and we also know, especially especially online, that the power of instructor presence to build connection and engagement and support students has to be done intentionally. How can we replicate this high touch feeling that we have when we walk across campus or walk into a classroom in an online setting? So how I do this is I do a lot of imperfect videos. Now, I also do instructional videos. I do kind of talking head mini lectures. I do content videos. But how do I recreate that feeling where I would go into, if you're anyone from Miramar here, if I go into the H building and there's a class leaving and all my students are lined up in the hallway and I'm chatting and talking and gosh, that seems like such a long time ago, <laughs> years ago, but walking through the hallway and chatting and seeing everyone or going across campus campus to the library to grab a cup of coffee and waving at a student and ask them how I'm how they're doing how do we create that human instructor presence online 
So I like to do little videos during the week. Um, I just do them wherever I can fit them in. Um, Martez and I are both busy working parents. Um, so I record a lot of videos in my car while I'm waiting for my son's basketball practice to be over. I um, record a lot of videos while I'm walking my dog. Um, so students are really seeing kind of the human element about me. And then I share those um, through Canvas. I also use Pronto, but the fastest way I share them is I throw them onto Instagram stories. So I did link my um, professor Instagram. It's kind of hard for me to watch myself on video, but if you go through this, you can see lots of kind of the silly one minute videos of me. I'm going to play the last one that I did last week. So here we go. Here's me. Get ready for very shaky camera work. So this is real life. I'm just holding the phone as I'm walking. I'm using an app called the Clips app, which does have really amazing live captioning that you can correct. Hi everyone, by now you are in the second week of the semester and you're kind of underway. You have gone through the introductory module and are getting right into course content. You probably have lots of assignments and readings and materials that you are working on already. So that means that you are on your computers a lot or on your devices as you are working on all of your course materials. I want to encourage you to take breaks to get outside when you can and make sure you have a chance to move around. So I am out here on my walk with Bella. Say hi. There's Bella. I try to get outside for a couple walks a day and that helps break up my work on the computer. Let me know down below how you give yourself breaks and how you find ways to rest in between all of your work. Okay, Bella's actually the secret superstar of my classes. <laughs> Everyone asks how she's doing and she appears in multiple videos. One of the really great things about doing those videos is that students have responded that they feel like it's a real class. And it's just really funny to get these student evaluations or these comments and they say, it felt real because I am a real person and they are seeing the real me. Uh, I drop things in the video. Sometimes my kid runs by, Bella often barks, but those are the kinds of things that happen when you walk across campus or you go into your classroom. You're getting kind of that, that real person. Um, the other side effect that has been really, really fun is that students that I no longer teach still check in and they'll comment on the video and they'll say hi or they'll check in about Bella um, or they'll say oh, I remember we did that what would you hold to and they'll make a comment so this class and instructor community lasts far beyond the 16 weeks of my course um, and it builds a little micro community that goes through all of my students which I think is just really really wonderful so I want to encourage you to be imperfect and to be human as well. Okay, let me stop screen sharing and I'm going to turn it over to Maritza's class and I'm, I'm noting the questions and we'll come to those at the end. Awesome. Thanks so much for, um, for that, Denise. So after you've already kind of established that strong classroom community, then you can start having students share um, about some of the deeper course content. And so those are the examples that I'm gonna share with you. Um, and before I share some examples of my students' work, here's some background on two of my classes. One of them is an English 1A class, composition and reading. It's similar to a freshman composition class. And this class I teach asynchronously online. And the theme of the course is race and social justice. And then I'm gonna share also some examples from another class I teach called English 1AX, which is intensive reading and writing. And this class has an ESL focus. So this is a freshman composition class with um, advanced level ESL students. Um, and this class is, um, one of the classes that we created due to AB705. So um, it's an entry level uh, freshman comp class. And um, this class I've taught both as a hybrid and also as an asynchronous online class. And the theme of this class is on US immigration. And um, if you knew me, <laughs> then you would also know that I was a sociology major in undergrad. So I'm always putting my sociological lens, even when I teach English. 
So I'm going to start with sharing um, some examples from my English 1A class. And um, this in this course, they study a unit on microaggressions. So they read diverse, um, read, read different articles from diverse authors that represent multiple perspectives about microaggressions. And um, they do have to um, participate in a flip grid. And so this is um, the prompt for them. In your first video, tell us uh, a situation where you experienced or witnessed any kind of microaggression occur. According, according to Daryl Wing Sue's chart, which theme would this fall under? What was the implied meaning by the perpetrator? And how did it make you feel? How'd you react? And then they go in and they reply to their classmates with friendly reactions, questions, and or comments. Students can watch this video over here where I explain the prompt. And one thing I really like to do on my Flipgrids is um, create an example uh, video. So um, I pin it to the top just by clicking this little pin here so that um, students see that video first and they uh, watch it as a model for them to follow. So that's what I did here in this video. Um, I responded to the prompt. And um, here are two of my students' perspectives, uh, videos. Most of them did uh, reply with their own firsthand experiences as victims of microaggressions. So the first one is from Twee. One of my experiences with microaggressions is in my eighth grade science class when we were having a week that was dedicated to sex ed. There were two women that were in charge and one of them was taking attendance. And then when she got to my name, like many other times, she had difficulty pronouncing it. So I tried to correct her and we went back and forth until my teacher decided to anglicize my name as he said that it was easier said this way instead. This falls under the category of alien in one's own land as he simplified my name and decided that pronouncing it a different way would have caused less of an inconvenience. I didn't know how to feel at it, about it when it happened as I just assumed that it's, if it was easier for them then I would have been okay with it but thinking back it wasn't okay that they did that and it was a form of microaggression. And the second example I'm going to share with you is Jarrell's. Hello, so I have two examples of how I've dealt with microaggression. Um, the first one is when I was in middle school, I, around eighth grade, I went with a few friends to the movie theaters and I was the only African American there. And it was a few girls and a couple guys. They were Latino and Caucasian, but I was the only African American there. So the officer eventually followed me around the entire movie theater. And then around 30 minutes of the movie, he came in and pulled me out and claimed that I hit someone. But that wasn't me. And he said that I had a black jacket on, but I didn't have a jacket there. So that was criminality slash assumption of criminal status. And then the other example I have is when I walked in a, um, an elevator when I was in Florida and it was, I was by myself and it was a few other Caucasian women in the elevator as well. And they were clutching their purses and I noticed that. So I did feel a little not so happy about that because I didn't do anything. I was just in the elevator and I think it was just because of my race. And um, as you can see down below, Jarrell received some um, video replies from some of his peers where um, oftentimes they also shared other stories where they were assumed to be a criminal uh, and were treated that way. So, um, so after students really feel comfortable, like after they've gotten to know each other and you've established that, you can dive really deep into your content and have them share stories of the concepts that you're teaching in class. And now I'm gonna go over to my English 1AX class. And this is the one with the ESL focus with the theme of US immigration. Uh, their final project incorporates multiple things, documenting oral histories 
through a firsthand interview, researching secondary sources, argumentative writing, and an Adobe Spark video, who recently changed their name to Adobe Creative Cloud Express. So um, in my class, the students actually have to write out their video scripts and go through a whole revision process um, before recording. Um, and then for accessibility, I have my students read their scripts aloud and then copy and paste the words onto the screen, which serve as the captions. So you'll see that in these two examples. This, my students uh, share their videos to the class in a whole class discussion on Canvas. And I include some quick video directions on how to embed your video onto the discussion. So I'm gonna go ahead and share with you uh, two examples. And on this discussion, um, the peers also um, gave each other some feedback on their videos. Uh, so the first one is for uh, An. Hello everyone, my name is Wan. Today in this video, I will tell you guys about one story, the story about migrations of the boat people after the end of the Vietnam War in 1975. On April 30, 1975, the Vietnam War, or what I was taught in Vietnam as the resistance war against the Americans, was over. The army of Viet Cộng from North of Vietnam took over Saigon, the heart of Northern Vietnam. After that, they rapidly established the Socialist Republic of Vietnam to reunify over the country. The new leaders of the new government began to revenge against who had served and supported the U.S. with brutally oppressive regime. Not only punished those who served former government, they confiscated people's property and belongings with the simple reason that the country needed financial resources to recover after the war. In one night, many people became homeless, were imprisoned, or killed. Life was then extremely difficult for South Vietnamese people. As a result, a mass exodus of Vietnamese refugees, also known as boat people, risked their lives in crowded and fragile boats and fled across the ocean to other countries in search of peace, freedom, and safety. This incredible journey was interviewed from my mother-in-law, who had escaped from Vietnam with her two sons in 1979. There was no looking back. Even though Vietnam is my beloved country, we could not live under communistic government. They were so greedy by confiscating our home, money, and willing to kill anyone who did not obey their orders, she claims with a heavy sigh. Worrying about their family's future and safety, she and her husband decided to prepare for this challenging journey, which was an illegal act in the contemporary Vietnamese society. One day in the end of 1978, her husband and his relatives were out at sea to fish, and they realized that this was a suitable chance to set sail leaving the country in hopes of being saved by the U.S. Navy ship. Since then, my mother-in-law had no contact with her husband, who were thousands of miles away. All she could do was to pray that he made it out safely and hoped to hear from him in the near future. Gradually, she realized that more hardship from the new government was oppressed on South Vietnamese people. Hence, my mother-in-law made her courage to leave the country as well. She took two of her sons, one was five and the other was seven, and headed for a boat that was scheduled to leave at the break of door in 1979. As they approached the boat, she could hear gunshots from a distance trying to stop people from approaching the boat. Some people who tried to run to the boat were caught. 
Some even were killed. Luckily, she made it on a boat and sail off. They were in a fragile boat, which was often used for sailing near shore, but was not designated for travel to the open sea. There were more than 150 people on that small and thin boat. They had very little space for each person to sit. Most of them almost crawled on the floor of the boat for days and nights. As they drifted along sea, she counted the days that led to weeks, then months. Floating on water for a long period of time, people on the boat were out of victor and water. Her sons became ill due to the conditions they were in along with having inadequate food sources and lack of water. However, they could not drink seawater because they would die quicker due to dehydration. She recalls her memory. I gave my sons my last bit of bread and forced them to drink the urine to avoid dehydration. At least, that water kept them alive. I'm going to go ahead and, and pause here, but um, she goes on to describe the long... <laughs> boat a ride um, all the way to the United States, which took uh, months uh, eventually. Um, and then at the end, it did uh, end with a happy ending. So um, uh, I wanted to go ahead and uh, in the interest of time and share one more video with you by Sheila on her immigration story. The Immigration Story by Sheila Swella. My immigration story began when my grandfather, Modesto Briones, signed up to join the U.S. Army during the World War II, where he served as a driver to General Douglas MacArthur and a cook while he was in the Philippines. During that time, my native country was in turmoil. Because of the war, there are no certainties on the economic instability of the Philippines and many places were devastated from the adverse of the war. The Commonwealth of the Philippines was attacked by the Japanese on December 8, 1941, and nine hours later, Pearl Harbor was attacked. This is when the U.S. military recruited many Filipinos to join the U.S. Armed Forces to fight as soldiers alongside the Americans. According to my aunt, the soldiers who joined the U.S. military service were guaranteed U.S. citizenship and opportunity to migrate to the United States with their families after the war. This was exactly what my grandfather did after the Second World War. He grabbed the opportunity to migrate to the United States. However, my grandfather signed up to join the Industrial Merchant Marine where he worked until he retired. Although he worked in various places before he signed up to be a Merchant Marine. Okay, and I'm gonna pause that one there. So um, my students, um, already made videos, these Adobe Spark videos previously in the class. This is their part of their final project. And um, they did them earlier in the class in groups. So my students were um, reading a book together in book clubs. And um, part of what they needed to do with their book club was, was collaborate to create an Adobe Spark video. So they were able to lean on one another um, to figure out the technology. Um, and so by the time they did this, they were already prepared um, and, and the technology didn't get in the way. It was really more just about focusing on the content. All right, so one last example I'd like to share with you is uh, my day one video announcement. And this is a video that I made that I uh, send to my students on the first day. And they would receive this after already receiving uh, my welcome email a week before that has a link to my liquid syllabus and my welcome video where I share my story 
with them. Um, so this is a really short 33 second video saying, we start today. <laughs> Hi, welcome aboard. Your English 1A adventure begins today. It's Professor Apigo, and I'm looking forward to teaching you over the next 16 weeks as you learn to become a better reader, writer, critical thinker, and researcher. Be sure to log into Canvas where I have everything ready for you in the week one module to become oriented and set up to be successful in this course. I can't wait to meet you and get to know you on Flipgrid One. Bye for now. And what I ended up doing was um, each week, my students receive a video announcement like this from me. And um, I'm on all these various places on campus. So sometimes I'm in the cafeteria, I'm in the library, I'm you know walking on campus. So um, it kind of has that theme of, um, various places on campus where I'm, you know, just reaching out to you with an announcement. All right, so I'm going to go back to our slides and share with you um, the student feedback that we received. Um, we've received so much positive feedback from our students on these video-based story sharing activities. A couple of Denise's students shared uh, that I enjoy creating my story videos. I think when they do them, when we do them, you can learn your classmates' point of view as well as tell your personality. Another student says, the projects in this class make me feel like I'm not in an online class. It makes me feel like a real class and I'm closer to my classmates. And a couple of my students shared on an anonymous feedback survey that Professor Apigo's final video project really touched my heart. And I learned so much about other students in the class. I shared the video with my entire family. Another student shared, now that the class is over, I will really miss Professor Apigo, especially her Monday morning video greetings. <laughs> I love that they were used to seeing you every week, Martez. <laughs> so we have just a couple examples here of more instructor created examples. Marta showed her welcome video. Um, weekly video announcements are really wonderful because what students often get is, you know, kind of the list of to do's or the tasks of what's upcoming for the week. So doing that with a short video announcement really is a great way to leap into the new week, um, remembering that their instructor is a real person in here to support them. Another thing that is really, really nice is, uh, is giving video or audio feedback on students' work. So as writing instructors especially, it's, it's tough to receive that, that feedback of what challenges there may be and what we're you know, offering support to improve on. But to hear someone's voice with empathy and encouragement um, say what could be improved on is a lot easier, right? Sometimes than receiving that by text and a video is even better. So I've been incorporating video or audio feedback a lot more in um, reviewing my students' work. And of course, we do instructional videos as well. Um, we just wanted to really highlight these other ways that we can increase our presence um, and make sure our students know that we're really there for them. Okay, so you've heard a lot from us and I know that a lot of wheels are turning and I see all the questions, but let's take another two minutes and just add in the chat uh, your answer to this question. How do you amplify student stories in your discipline?
So many wonderful, wonderful ideas are coming in the chat. I love the poster. There was one about family stories, um, lots about connecting stories to concepts and um, you know content in the classroom. Lots of us are giving audio feedback. I love this idea of family video projects. Um, And I love this idea somebody shared beyond the classroom, sharing with others as well. So um, others in the, our academic and college communities hear our student stories. Sometimes those are really, really left out. Wonderful, wonderful examples. Thank you all for sharing. Keep on adding those in. Um, this really just dovetails on this slide about ideas for other disciplines. There's way more in the chat now than what we have listed here. I, I have learned from some of the STEM and math um, professors in my college that there's really wonderful ways to find out students' stories of experience in their discipline. I feel like a lot of stories have like, a lot of students have their math story. Like, how do you feel about math? Like, how did you come to this? And so being able to start with that has been really helpful for some of my colleagues. Um, I have a really great friend who does really cool things with explanations and analysis in the history class. It doesn't have to be a term paper. I think Marta has just showed that with her class. It can be a video project instead. Reflections are really nice as videos as well or audios. And anytime that we can use real life examples to explain the course concepts is always wonderful. And I'm seeing a lot of that in the chat. So we have more to add to this slide from all of you. So thank you. And incorporating video and student stories can still be done in synchronous, hybrid, and on-campus modalities. Even when I'm teaching on campus, I still play my welcome video on day one. And you know, I hear the students applause afterwards. <laughs> So we've shared with you a lot of asynchronous examples, but in synchronous courses, you have the ability to orient them to the technology while screen sharing and answering questions live. Uh, students' stories could be shared in Zoom breakout rooms. You could incorporate Padlets, Jamboards uh, to document their conversations. And Zoom chats could also be a space for students to share their stories. In hybrid and on-campus courses, I've rolled in our Chromebook carts uh, and, and have everyone get familiarized with the technology. Um, while we're on campus, we record a sample video um, and troubleshoot while I'm there with them in the room. Um, I've had students um, deliver oral presentations instead of recording videos if I'm teaching in those modalities. Um, and in one of my, uh, when I was teaching the hybrid course, I once team, teamed up with another instructor who was teaching a similar unit on U.S. immigration. And we, one day we planned for um, bringing in two Chromebook cards and put our classes together for a showcase. And um, we watched each other's videos that we created. So that, that was a really fun activity. Denise and I have placed some helpful links to resources for you on this slide. If you'd like to dig deeper and learn more about Flipgrid and about uh, Adobe Creative Cloud Express. And here's our contact information if you'd like to reach out to us. Denise and I thank you so much. And I am going to turn it back over to you, Michelle, for our Q&A. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, so much appreciation for both of you and for your students in the chat. So I hope that you've, you've had a couple of moments to take a look at, at what was happening there. Um, yeah, so we do have some questions. Um, we use the social upvoting, which is kind of a helpful way to see, you know, which questions are, are shared amongst people. And we have a lot of interest in getting um, or wondering if you would be willing to share the instructions for your story assignments. You were gracious to, to show those and those will be captured in the archive, but I'll just pass that over to you and see what your thoughts are about that. 
I'm happy to share. And I, I'll i add it, I think, to the resources. I have some links that go straight to the assignments. I think that's probably the easiest way. Maybe we could add one more slide with assignments and then just put the links there. What do you think, Martez? <laughs> Yeah, totally willing to share too. I um I think it might be best to like take a screenshot because they're in Canvas, so uh, links might not work. But we can add some more resources to the slides since everyone already has that link. That would be great. Thanks so much. Um, and then there's some questions about questions slash concerns about supporting students. So. Talk to us a little more, and you, you shared some great examples about how you how you do support your students in terms of those who don't really understand how to use the tools, right? Martez, you spoke specifically about the scaffolding, so having students work in groups the first time they use the Adobe, whatever the new name of it is, and I can't believe they changed the name. <laughs> Um, but giving them that first step in a group environment. And so when it gets to the final project, it's not like it's a new tool. It's something they've used before. And I think that's an outstanding suggestion. Um, what other suggestions do you have for supporting students with the use of the tool? And then secondly, the flip side of that is, let's talk a little bit about what students need to actually use it. Like, I, you know where I'm going with that, the, the phone. I do have students who, who don't have the, the technology. Does that actually happen to you? Well, one thing that I like I've done is I record little how-to videos. So here's how to get started in, you know, every, and I'll walk them through the steps, logging in all the way to, you know, picking a template, adding, you know, um, adding your voice, like how to record your voice and all of that. So they have those videos that they can um, reference. Um, and then I have videos like you saw, how do you take that and add it to a Canvas discussion? They have to like go and hunt down the embed code. So there's step-by-step -step, um, how-to videos that I put in my class at the time of need, um, which is really helpful because then I don't get barraged with um, all the questions. <laughs> um, so just anticipating you know, exactly what they're gonna need um, so that they can be successful with the technology. Yeah, and I'll add on to that, that there's just something better for the students when it's us making the video. Like all of these tools have the, you know, kind of the, the video tutorials from the company or they can YouTube it, but it's really different, you know, if I am like, here's me, I'm creating my account, I'm adding this photo of me as a child, and now I'm recording my first sentence, once upon a time, and that those little mini step by steps of exactly the project we're doing. Um, it takes time, but it's better than sending them to the company site that's full of lengthy tutorials. Um, and then the other thing I'll say, which Marta has mentioned as well, is that, for example, Flipgrid. So we build up throughout the semester. So I never want them to have a barrage of like 20 tools. Like there's one really for that, for my listening and speaking class. We're going to use Flipgrid the whole time, right? So we're going to just work out all the kinks at the beginning so that after the first two or three weeks, no one has any more questions. We're just able to do it. Um, and then the first thing is not a big scary content heavy project it's a how do you say your name so they're really kind of focused on the tech right then how do we do this technology not what is this big concept i'm trying to learn and so then once everyone has established they know how to do this we're building community along the way then we can move on to the deeper course content where they're really grappling with the topic with the writing with the reading and they're they're focused on that. The tech is like, oh, I just press record and they're no longer worried about that. Um, and I don't switch it halfway. Like halfway, I don't say, no, let's use voice right now. Oh, yeah, well, let's do, you know, this other voice thing. It's like, we're just going to use this one, you know, tool for this particular activity and let everyone get comfortable with it. Yes, I think that's so important, Denise, how, um, how you, you set your students up with just something really simple for the first time they're going to use the tech. Um, and then from there, you can, you know, it's a springboard to your course content, right? When it, before my students um, record their first Adobe Spark video, I gave them the prompt 
in an Adobe Spark video. <laughs> so this is what you're about to create, what you're watching here. So they got to see an example before they even got in using it. Thank you. And um, just to break down for, you know, for those out, those of you out there who haven't used these tools yourself, Flipgrid and Adobe Creative Cloud Express can be used on a computer or on a phone. So it, it, it's, it's, it's pretty accessible in terms of students having one of those two, those two devices and being able to complete the content. Um, and I always like to encourage professors who are thinking about it, like sit down and use it yourself, right? That's the best way to kind of understand how simple it really is. And it is, YouTube model that so well in terms of really being knowledgeable about the, about the technology. And that can be, it can feel really overwhelming, but I think once you actually do it yourself, it kind of demystifies everything and makes you have that self-efficacy, which is really important in introducing it to your students. Um, so we also have a question about integrating Flipgrid into Canvas. Who wants to take that one? I have a video for that. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's the first link, the first link on the resources slide. Yeah, and, and that video will walk you through step by step because the first time there are more steps um, than um, then when you do it, when you create more and more Flipgrid assignments, just that first time you have to kind of set up the integration first. Um, and then after that, you're good to go to adding more Flipgrid assignments. So watch that video and hit pause and do the steps yourself side by side. Yeah, so you're talking about the, the LTI, the, the Flipgrid LTI. And I'll say this, just one little thing for those of you out there, because supporting um, faculty at the state level, which is what, what our team does, is that there are some institutions that actually don't allow that integration to happen without permission from a support team. So just keep that in mind too. And you probably even mentioned that in your video because I know how good you are and how knowledgeable you are of all that stuff. But um, yeah, that's great. Thank you for having that video. I think I'm gonna check that one out and share it as well with some of the folks I know. Um, we also had some questions about Instagram, and I think there may have been a little bit of confusion about, um, you know, are you recording into Instagram? Are you, and there are questions about how Instagram connects to Canvas. So, and then you talked about clips. So maybe you can demystify that workflow a little bit. I like how I was like, use one tool and make it clear. <laughs> then I just, oh, there was four things mentioned there. So here's the, uh, the kind of setup of how I do it. I record on my phone using clips. The, the free app um, and there is a link to that on the resource page. And then there's a bunch of things you can do with that. The first thing I do after correcting my captions is I download it to my phone so that I just have it as a video. And I actually use that video to share with it with my students on Canvas. So I'm not recording on Instagram and I don't require I would never require my students to have a social media account and or follow me really. So I make sure that that video then goes to Canvas and, and or Pronto if you're using Pronto, but it's going out to students in a regular video format that they can access and that everyone receives through the announcements. But because I do have an educator Instagram page, um, Clips just has a, like, you can push it to your social media. So I do just push it right to my Instagram stories um, so that it's there. And um, students can see it any, you know, any way that they like to. Normally what happens is that I'll post it and then I'll start getting views um, and comments like fairly immediately. Um, and then students later will check their email later or their Canvas announcements and then other students will see it. So nobody's left out and it's not required, but it does seem like an easy way for me to reach students one more little step. Um, and this Instagram is completely separate from my family or my personal Instagram. So they don't see that. It is public, but uh, you do have to have Instagram to view it. So that's why I downloaded and keep it separate as well. Thank you for that. Um, I didn't mention this um, verbally, so let me say it. We are recording this and the archive will be shared on our equitable online teaching workshop um, page. 
And so it's the same place where you want to register for this. Um, I will put that link in the chat again, just so everybody knows. We'll have it there in a day or so. We do that pretty quickly. Um, Laura has made a suggestion that you think about sharing your um, assignments in the Canvas Commons. So that's something to, um, to consider. And can you confirm that the Adobe tool that used to be called Adobe Spark that's now called Adobe Creative Cloud Express is still free? It yes, is it free. is, yeah. Good deal, excellent. And we have a question from Laureen who's asked, who's saying that she has used StoryCorps to record stories. Have you ever used this? Have you taken oral history classes? I haven't used um, StoryCorps for students to record, but I have had them do lots of activities with the stories on that site. And I know there's really, really amazing things going on with StoryCorps. It's one of those things I keep, like I have that list of things I want to check out more. So if anyone's doing that, I definitely wanna hear how, how that goes. They have amazing prompts and you can send them to the archives, I believe nationally. Um, I think it's a wonderful resource. I haven't used it that way yet. Yeah, I haven't either, but I do wanna check it out. Um, I know that there's several, different um, kind of story telling apps out there. Um, and um, I did start kind of playing around with some of them where they have um, templates with different settings and then you'd like choose different characters and different objects you wanna bring into the story. So um, so there's, there's a lot of possibilities out there um, if you wanna explore like having your students use any of those kind of apps. Wonderful. And uh, we have a, a, a request to share the chat with the archive and that is something that we can accommodate. Yes, we can do that for you. Um, and that's our last question, but we do still have five minutes left. So I just want to invite folks out there to raise your hand if you have a comment that you'd like to share or a question using your microphone, if you in the Zoom toolbar select raise hand, uh, we can go ahead and, and give you the, the, the rights to share with your, your camera or your microphone. So I'll keep my eyes on the um, list here and see if we have any hands go up. We did also just get another question in the q and I see that. Um, let's see, Let, Jessica is asking, do you have recommendations for students who may be resistant to sharing much about their own personal background in their stories? One of the examples I have is this great one of a student who shared the story of her dog instead of her own story. Um, so what I, what I think is wonderful about this is it allows the students to make the choice. So if a student doesn't wanna tell all of the personal background of how they came to Miramar College, right? They can do a different type of story. And there are, I shared a very personal one, obviously, um, with my student, but there are very varying levels of what people share. And I think that just allowing um, that choice is really important. Um, and I, and I think that it, students do open up over time. One really funny example I have um, with Flipgrid is um, I had students, a lot of times they don't want to show their face. So they will, um, <laughs> they'll like record something and they'll have like a stuffed animal or like, you know, lots of, I get a lot of pets, but sometimes they'll have their stuffed animal and they'll be recording about themselves or their story. Um, and there was one young woman who did that for a while, but then finally near the end, she was in the video, but then she was holding the stuffed animal. <laughs> It's like there she is it was the cutest thing but we had all kind of been knowing uh, her through her through her stuffed animal um, but i do think we have to be very careful with what we ask of students and allowing them to have the freedom and the choice of how much they're willing to share yeah um so what about these stories after the class is over there's a question about archiving them. Do you ask permission to archive them? Do you have to ask permission to archive them? I think that's something important to talk about too. 
I think that they, um, you know, they, like Denise said, they share what they're comfortable with sharing. Um, it becomes part of like the class content. And I always ask for permission before sharing them with others outside of the class. So the ones that you saw today um, had permission to share, um, but they are, they are kind of just a piece that's archived in the class. And um, the, the students choose to do whatever they'd like with their videos. You know, I've heard of them sharing them with the people who they interviewed for the project or um, with their families, um, because it is documenting their family history, right? Um, and then I've even heard students tell me like, oh, I love Adobe Spark video. I'm, I'm using it to make like family photo albums now and like video, um, photo uh, videos. I'm like, <laughs> so, um, so some of them even use the tool beyond the class. It's a non-disposable assignment, right? They can take it with them. And, and how much more meaningful is that? Absolutely. Yeah, and then I would just underscore what, what Maritez just said about asking for permission. That That is um, important to comply with FERPA, which is a federal uh, student privacy law to be sure that you do have permission from students before you share their work with anyone outside of the course, just like Marta said. Um, and then the other part of that that I find in my interactions with faculty, a lot of times we don't think about is that students, they're the copyright owners of that work. They own the copyright, like they're the creators and it's their copyright. So just like we would expect someone to ask permission to use our own work, it goes both ways. And that's really um, important to acknowledge. So we are at time. This has been such a joy um, to spend this time with you. I feel like this has been 75 minutes of self-care. So thank you so much for making this fun and um, rewarding and just sharing so much. And please extend a big warm thank you to your students also from all of us. Thanks for joining us, everyone. We'll get the archive process as soon as we can. And I wish everyone a wonderful, wonderful rest of the day. Thanks, Denise. Thanks, Martez. I'm gonna go ahead and end. It always feels awkward to end, but I'm gonna do that. <laughs> Take care.